Last 4th of July, we had a barbecue at my sister's house. However, we ended up spending most of the time inside because of the heat. We ended up congregating in her living room, and I noticed that she had two different types of windows. She explained to me that she recently replaced most of her windows with these expensive, energy-efficient models. But she did keep a few of her old ones for aesthetic purposes, even though they are letting in all the summer sun's heat. And this is fairly common, because windows installed before the 1990s have the efficiency close to that of a car window. And we know that car windows let in a ton of heat. If you're like me, in the summer months, you end up spending your trip to the grocery store just trying to cool down the car and get comfortable. You buy a few items, and by the time you're out, the car is already hot to the touch. But we don't really think about how much heat comes through our windows of our buildings, because we're constantly regulating the temperature inside. But if we scale up this example of a car to a building, it shouldn't be too surprising that we waste 4% of all U.S. energy due to these inefficiencies. This ends up costing the U.S. $40 billion a year. It results in 24 billion kilograms of CO2 released into our atmosphere. That's the same amount of emissions that would be caused by 120 million cars annually. 120 million. So this is obviously a problem that we need to address somehow. And because of the environmental and the economic problem presented, there are companies that are trying to address this. But the solutions have problems in them themselves. First, these energy efficient windows usually have a tint or a discoloration to them, which prevents adoption from residential homeowners. Second, it requires you to hire a professional to come out, to measure your windows, to cut these windows to size, move your furniture away from the windows, and then actually install them. And this can cost upwards of $10,000. So the windows don't pay for themselves for at least 10 years in the savings you get in your energy bill. So there's not really an option for someone like my sister who wants to keep her old windows, or for lower income families, specifically those that might be in hotter urban areas that don't have 10 years to wait for their investment to return. So how do we make a more energy efficient window, at least one that can block heat, that doesn't have this tint or discoloration and would pay for itself relatively quickly? Well, to address any problem, we have to understand the fundamental science behind the problem. And when we think about the sun coming through our windows, we typically think about ultraviolet light, the stuff that can give us sunburns, ruin our furniture and our floors. We think about visible light, everything that you're able to see. And we think about infrared or radiation, which for the purposes of today's talk is just a way that heat can get through our windows and is relatively unwanted. About 43% of the solar spectrum is this visible light, which we obviously want. But a majority of it, a staggering 52%, is this infrared radiation, which is just bringing heat through our windows. So how do we specifically target the infrared radiation without getting these discolored or these tinted windows? Well, to address this, we need to understand how color works. And usually when we think about color, we think about pigments and dyes. Your shirt can be dyed, you can add a pigment to a paint and apply it to your wall. Both pigments and dyes work in the same way, and that works through what the pigment or the dye absorbs. So in this first example, we have a red surface. And the dye that's in this red surface is absorbing every color except for red. So you only see what's remaining, which is the red light. And in a more complicated way, the dye can absorb red's complementary color on the color wheel, which is green. So what's happening here is all of the colors that are left and are not absorbed appear red to your eye. Now there's a second, more complicated type of color, and that's color from structure. I didn't even know what color from structure was until I started my PhD. But it's relatively common and used by nature a lot, such as by these opals or these butterflies, to get the blue, the green, and the yellow colors you see here. And the way that structural color works is it's a special arrangement of atoms on the small nanoscale and how light interacts with these structures or these geometries. So let's take a little bit of a dive into how structural color can help us with our window problem. In science, we call these color-giving structures photonic crystals. 
But photonic crystal is a really fancy way of saying that we have a selective mirror. And what I mean by a selective mirror is that we can selectively reflect one wavelength away from the photonic crystal and allow everything else to go through. And using a simple equation called the Bragg equation, we know that we can change the domain sizes or the spacing of these alternating layers in the photonic crystal shown here, and we can target different wavelengths of reflection that we're mirroring. Thus, we can also figure out what's going to go through. So let's see how this works. In our first example shown here, we have a relatively small photonic crystal. When we shine the solar spectrum through it, we're going to reflect short wavelengths because the domain sizes are small. So short wavelengths correspond to something like ultraviolet light, violet light, and blue light, like our butterfly example shown here. But everything that's not going to be reflected is going to go through our photonic crystal. So the longer wavelengths, like green, yellow, or red, but also our infrared light, which causes heat. So if we increase the domain size of our photonic crystal just a little bit, now we're going to be reflecting longer wavelengths of light, which could correspond to something like our green, our yellow, and our reds. Now our short wavelengths are going to pass right through the photonic crystal, the stuff we were reflecting earlier, but our really long wavelengths are still going to go through, so our heat is going through our photonic crystal. And it's not until we increase the domain size of our photonic crystal sufficiently enough that we're now reflecting these really long wavelengths of light, which correspond to the infrared light, which heats up our house. But the color is able to go right through. So you could imagine, if there's some way that we could put these photonic crystals on our window, we could reflect the heat back out, but the visible light would come right through our windows. So how do we get these photonic crystals on our window without expensive manufacturing processes? Well, to do that, we leverage something called self-assembly and let nature do the work for us. Self-assembly works by trying to lower the energy of a system. Now, when I think about this, I think about mixing oil and water. When you mix oil and water, the oil beads up. It doesn't want to mix with the water. But it rapidly self-assembles to the lowest energy it could possibly be. You would have to input energy to mix this back up, either by stirring by yourself or some other means. And in chemistry, we have this very cool technology called block copolymers. A block copolymer is a way that we can link two things together, kind of like gummy worms. <laughs> so if we imagine these gummy worms are like the green parts like oil, and the yellow part is like water, they're chemically linked together in our block copolymer. They want to separate, but they can't, because again, they're linked together. So our gummy worms have to assemble in such a way that it has that low energy, it self-assembles. And the yellow wants to be with the yellow, and the green wants to be with the green. So hopefully, this alternating structure is starting to look like the photonic crystals we talked about earlier. And by changing the size of our gummy worms, we're changing the domain spacing, which means we can change the wavelength of reflection. So using this block copolymer technology, we can tune our photonic paint to reflect ultraviolet, visible light, and all the way through infrared. So, what if we could put this photonic paint in a spray can that you could buy at your local home department store? Well, that's exactly what we're working on at Colorado State University in collaboration with California Institute of Technology and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We want to put this photonic paint in a spray can so that you can retrofit your old and inefficient windows to be able to be energy efficient again. You would apply the spray paint yourself in a thin film that would self-assemble on your window to this thin, transparent film that would have no tint or discoloration. And this would cost 10 times less than anything else on the market and pay for itself within a year. This would be ideal for something like skyscrapers, which are constantly getting beat down on by the sun. But it would also be great in residential areas, where the homes are constantly under cooling loads and want to be comfortable reflecting the heat. You wouldn't want this in an application where you'd want that natural sunlight to come in, because we're reflecting the heat away from your windows, not reflecting it back in. So while we're not painting your house quite yet, we are able to paint windows in the lab scale, and there is no tint, there is no discoloration, the solution is clear. 
Using our photonic paint, you'll be able to re reflect a majority of the sun's heat in the form of infrared radiation. So hopefully, the next time I return to my sister's house on a hot summer month, we can apply these to our windows and stay cool and comfortable. Thank you.